Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. It is indeed a good and a beautiful thing when God's people gather together for worship. If you haven't already done so, I'd like to invite you to grab your family and gather them around you so that they can share in this worship experience with you. We try really hard to make sure there's a little bit of something for everyone in our worship services. And if you're watching today via Zoom, I'd like to invite you to stop now and turn your camera on so that we can see you and you can see us just like we usually do when we gather together in the church building on Sunday mornings. Our opening song this morning is Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. You can find it in your Presbyterian hymnals on page 610 if you happen to have one at home. And if you don't, don't worry, we'll put the words on the screen so that you can sing along with us. Let us sing together with joy in our hearts. Join me now as we bow our heads in prayer. O God, our rock and our refuge, we come to you after yet another week in a world that is rapidly changing, and we are struggling to keep up. And yet we still come. Still we gather in the best way that we know how for the hope and the joy that you bring to your people. Wherever we have fallen short this week, Lord, when we have lost our patience, when we have lost our hope, when we have spoken hurtful words to others, or when we have let our pride get the better of us, we ask your forgiveness, for we know that you are quick to forgive. We want to lift up to you those who are in need today. Particularly this week, we pray for all students, for all teachers, and for all parents who are learning to be teachers again all of whom are settling in for the long road ahead. Lord, give them your wisdom, give them your grace and your blessing today and in the weeks to come. And finally, Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to the message that you want us to hear today in this service. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray all of these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all of God's people together say, Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. We'll be reading from the NRSV translation. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. 
He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Why did Jonah not trust the ocean? Why? Because it seemed a little fishy to him. <laughs> Why was the cheese so silly? Why? Because it was cheesy. Mm -hmm. How do you make a tissue dance? How? Put a little boogie in it. <laughs> we are right in the middle of a three-part sermon series about encounters with Jesus on the road. Now, having just listened to the scripture passage today, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Jesus isn't even in this story. It's about an encounter between Philip, a leader in the early church, and an Ethiopian eunuch. How is this an encounter with Jesus? Well, in each of the three stories that we are considering in this series, the characters in question encounter Jesus in different ways. In last week's story, two disciples walk and talk and even share a meal with a very embodied Jesus on the road to Emmaus. In next week's story, Jesus appears in a vision from the heavens to the Apostle Paul. But this week's story, it's a little bit more subtle. Jesus, who is described by the Bible as the Word of God made flesh, appears in written form through the ancient scriptures of Isaiah and also in spoken or shared form through the words of Philip. My friend Helen Edwards, who's also one of our church leaders, has shared the story with some of you about how one day as a young girl, Jesus appeared to her in visible form on a forest path in her native Switzerland. My own mother has often shared with me stories about God speaking to her in a dream or a vision. Personally, I have never been fortunate enough to have had an encounter like either of those but I can count many times when I have felt the real and tangible presence of Christ when studying the Bible or in conversation with another person. So I think it's good to remember and to see in the scriptures that all of these are legitimate, life-transforming ways that we can encounter Jesus on our own roads, on our own spiritual journeys. I think it's also good to remember that sometimes we are actually called to be the representation of God's word in the life of another person, often even in the life of a complete stranger. That stranger in today's story is the Ethiopian eunuch. So what do we know about him? Well, just from verses 27 and 28 alone, quite a bit. First, he's an Ethiopian. 
Now, in the Bible, that's not so much a nationality as it is a broad term to refer to any of the dark-skinned people who lived south of Egypt. In the Jewish and in the Greek-speaking world, this Ethiopian eunuch is a minority. Second, in his home country, he's a pretty big deal. He is a high-ranking official in the court of the Ethiopian queen. He travels by a chariot, and he has in his possession a scroll from the book of Isaiah. Those are two valuable things that would only be available to a person of considerable wealth and power. Third, he's a eunuch. In the ancient world, and more recently in the Game of Thrones, a eunuch is someone who lacks reproductive genitalia. Now, that can happen in a number of different ways, as even Jesus himself mentions to his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus says that there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In several ancient texts outside the Bible where there are lists of people they refer to men, women, and eunuchs. So we know that eunuch was a catch-all phrase to describe individuals who didn't neatly fit into either of the two primary gender boxes of their day. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch in our story today is referred to five times simply as the eunuch and never by name. Clearly, the writer of the book of Acts wanted to emphasize that aspect of his story, and for good reason. We learn in verses 27 and 28 that he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. So from this, we can tell that clearly he's interested in the God of Israel, he's open to studying the scriptures, and he desires to worship God. God. But notice also, the verses say he had come to Jerusalem to worship, not that he was successful in doing so. There's a reason for that. In the book of Deuteronomy, the law of Moses, there are instructions in chapter 23 for who is and who is not allowed to worship in the temple. And the very first one of those instructions in chapter 23 states clearly that no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. Note that it doesn't matter, according to Deuteronomy, whether it was intentional, whether the emasculation was accidental, whether it was out of medical necessity, or whether it happened against a person's will. If you were a eunuch, you were excluded from worshiping at the temple. I suspect that the Ethiopian eunuch, despite all his wealth, all his power, his prestige, and his intense desire to enter God's house, I suspect he had a pretty disappointing experience at the end of his journey when he was not allowed to enter into the temple. Thankfully, what he thought was the end of his spiritual journey turned out to be just the beginning. When Amy and I got married, we looked for a church that we could be part of. She was raised Baptist, and I was raised Methodist. So for a while, we settled on a large, non-denominational church in North Dallas, where we lived at the time. The community wasn't very deep, but the worship and the sermons were great, and so for a while, we were happy enough. And then came September 11th, 2001 and the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers in New York City. Like a lot of people, we felt a deep need to be in church the following Sunday morning. So that morning when we arrived at the church, the parking lot was quite full, and an usher told us that the church had reached capacity, so he couldn't let us in. We asked if there might be another service later on that morning, or an overflow room somewhere so we could at least watch the service with other church members. But the answer was no, with the implication that we should simply come early 
next time. But of course, there wasn't a next time. We were crushed. It's a painful thing to be turned away from your church for reasons entirely outside your ability to control. So we never went back to that church. And the very next Sunday, we wandered into a small local Presbyterian church that became our spiritual home for the next eight years, where our two oldest children were baptized, where Amy and I sang in the praise band, and where I eventually joined the staff as director of music and youth ministry. Oh, and the pastor of that church, his name was Philip. He became a mentor and a close friend. He shared a new way, a very Presbyterian way, of understanding the Bible and God's love. And one day, Philip said to me, have you ever thought of going to seminary and becoming a pastor? By now, you know the rest of that story. Thank God for the Philips of this world, for the doors closed in our faces, and for the roads that lead us somewhere entirely different than where we thought we were supposed to be. Thank God for churches like this one that welcome all people who wander into our midst, physically and virtually, regardless of our race, our politics, our country of origin, our socioeconomic status, our gender identity, our religious heritage or lack thereof. But most of all, thank God for Jesus who meets us where we are on whatever road we're headed and sends just the right people in just the right moment to accompany us on our journeys and share God's love and God's word with us in new and refreshing ways. At the end of our story today, Philip is mysteriously whisked away after sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch and baptizing him. But the eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. Later, church tradition identifies him and gives him a name, Simeon Bacchus, and teaches that he went on to become the father of the Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa, a church which today numbers over 36 million members. May the same God who meets us on the road also meet our broken, rejected dreams with his open, unqualified embrace. And may we, too, be sent on our way rejoicing and sharing that love with everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. And now, with the confidence of God's children, let us pray together the prayer which our Lord taught us. Okay, go ahead. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Dear God, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for our pets, and I hope everyone enjoys them. And, and thank you for our plants, and thank you and thank you for our fishes, and thank you for our food, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 55, we read that God's word, when it has gone out among the people, shall not return empty, but shall accomplish its purposes. We've heard God's word, God's message for us today, and now we have a part to play in responding to it. The Schweitzer family would like to share with us, very creatively, I might add, some ways in which we can respond to God's Word and participate in the life of First Presbyterian Church and our community. Hi, we're the Schweitzer family. <gasps> if your 
watching or participating in our worship service for the first time today, we'd love to get to know you better. Leave us a note in the comment section letting us know you were here today. And if you'd like to sign up for our weekly email newsletter, you can use the comments section to let us know that too. Okay, Dad, you're up. Am I on? Is that good? Is this my good side? Okay. Our local mission partner, Project Vita, is in need of protective face masks for patients who come into their clinics. They see approximately 30 patients each day. If you're able to help by making and donating masks, please let us know. More information is available in our weekly newsletter, including instructions for making masks and the mailing address for Project Vita. If you enjoyed our worship service today, we're looking for volunteers to help put it together. If you'd like to help lead next week's service with a reading or by participating in our virtual music team, please contact Pastor Neil or just let us know in the comments. Pastor Neil is leading in a weekly online Bible study in the week of Exodus every Wednesday evening at 5.30 p.m. It's not too late to join in, and you can use the same link that got you here today. Thank you. Your financial support for our church is very important in these challenging times. You can donate to the church on our website, through our Facebook page, by using the Venmo app, or by sending a check through the mail. Finally, if there's someone in your life who needs the support of a faithful, loving community, please share today's message with them and invite them to connect with us through any of our online platforms. You can send in prayer requests in the comment section of this video or by emailing them to the church office. God bless you all and have a great week! Our closing song today is one you all know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. You can find the words and the music in the Presbyterian hymnal on page 649. We'll also put the words on the screen so you can sing along.
If you're joining us today via Zoom, for the past few weeks after the benediction, several of us have been sticking around for a little while longer, hanging out, chatting, catching up with each other, giving our kids a chance to see each other and wave and say hello. We invite you to do just that. I think we may even have some hatched butterflies to share with each other this morning. In any case, I hope you have a wonderful, blessed week. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.